All right, final step here. We've been learning how to do MLR in Python. We started out, uh, we're using the stats models package. Uh, we'll shift later to scikit-learn, but for now we use this because it looks a lot like what we did in Excel, the output at least. It generates coefficients, y-intercept, r-squared, adjusted r-squared, p-value, f-value, just like we had in Excel. So then we went and learned how to uh, use the get dummies method to create dummy codes. Uh, this is from pandas, so that we can include categorical columns. And we improved our R-squared, just like we did before in Excel. Then we went through and learned how to standardize. We didn't do this in Excel, um, but this was useful because it made it to where our coefficients were comparable now, uh, because they're all on the same scale. Now, the last step is to test our assumptions and to talk about our assumptions. So I'm going to refer to the output that we used last time in the prior video. First of all, we have down here this omnibus test, prob omnibus, and skew. This refers to a general overall skew score across all of the features. And you might remember that the rule is that skewness needs to be somewhere between negative one and one in order for our MLR to be valid. We're just outside of that. Well, the omnibus test is a way to test and see, it it's, it's kind of accomplishes something similar it looks at how close our overall model is to a normal distribution. All the variables together, are they close enough to be normally distributed? And it generates a score, kind of like an F score, but then there's a p-value for the omnibus, and if this p-value is significant, that means we have problems. We've violated the assumption of normality. So in this case, we do have problems that need to be fixed. We have some uh, other useful scores over here as well that we'll come back to in just a bit. First thing I want to do, though, is let's address the skewness issue. Now, I'm not going to fix the skewness of everything, but I do want to fix the skewness of the y variable. And I'm going to, I'm going to not worry about the standardized versions for now. I'm going to go back to our, um, we go back to our, uh, well, no, that's fine. I'll use this latest min-max version. What I want to do is convert this histogram of our, min max charges variable, I want to adjust the distribution with the mathematical transformation so that it becomes more normally distributed. Now this is right skewed or positively skewed and its skewness is greater than one. So to fix that we use functions that will have decreasing or increasingly um, tight or, or, or stronger conversions on higher numbers. So we need a nonlinear transformation. So for example, a square root transformation is not a straight, rather than making a straight line, a square root is a curved line that has a decreasing return. It gets lower and lower over time or has a decreasing rate over time. A cubed root would be even more severe and a natural log is the most severe. I'm going to apply a natural log transformation down here and see what that does for us. So I'll use this y, the min max, converted one and I say y equals and I imported numpy before so I can use this ln um, and I'm going to have to do an ln plus one because my min score is now a zero uh, and there is the natural log of zero is undefined so I think it's ln one p let's see if I remember it right and let's go ahead and make another uh, SNS, uh, is it SNS or SMS? SNS dot hist plot of the new Y. It's not 1P. I'm going to try. Uh, oh, it's log. That's what it is. Log 1P. That's it. All right, notice this looks a whole lot like what we had before, but it's not exactly the same. So here, this ranges from a count of 200 from zero to one. Here we've got a count of a little less from zero to seven. The problem is, is after transforming it, it's a little bit more difficult to have a natural log have a strong effect on converting this. Let me show you what happens if we do the same thing on the original data. So this plot once again, but this time we go right back to the original DF and go to charges. This is completely unconverted. I'll just go ahead and do the conversion right here. NP.log 
Um, I don't need to do 1p because there's no zeros in that original scale. All right, take a look at that now. Much more normally distributed when it's based on the original data. What does this mean? It just means that I want to make my conversions before I do my standardization. So now that I've got that converted, um, I could go through and convert my other variables too, but I'm just going to keep this video simple and just stick with it just like that. So what I want to do now is say my y now equals np dot log df dot charges, and uh, I could go through and min max standardize everything, but I'm going to keep this example simple. And uh, normally what I would do is then go through and once I create my conversions, do my standardization, normalization, and then run my model. But uh, I'll keep this simple here and just say this is uh, df.drop and make sure we drop our uh, predictions column and our charges column and then add our const equals one for our y-intercept. And then I'm going to print everything all in one. It's even more and more room here. Uh, print, uh, oops, smstatsmodels.ols, y, x, dot, fit, dot, summary. Let's see if I can do that all in one line, if it gets mad. Oh, got to spell this right. There we go. So, before, we had an R-squared of 75.1%. We just improved or reduced skewness and it's uh it's gone up a bit now notice down here our skew is a bit higher that's because i'm not using the standardized version let's take a look at what the skewness was before we did our standardizing all the way back up here uh right is it this one yes it was no right here this was the one so we had a 1.52 in the omnibus test of, of 325. Let's see if it made much of a difference at all. Uh, 1.697 and, and 463. So no, it didn't, didn't improve that a whole lot. However, uh, I want to leave this in the video because this doesn't mean that we did anything wrong. What it means is that this was our more accurate skewness the whole time. And after fixing the label, it just revealed some of the skewness that wasn't uh, wasn't readily available or, or could be detected before when both the label and the features were skewed. The idea is as we go through and fix skewness on each of the variables, including the features one at a time, eventually these scores will go back down. But as it is, even though these numbers are a bit higher, I trust this more than I trust our original prediction since the label, the most important one, is now on a more normal distribution. You might notice also here kurtosis. Uh, oh, part of the reason this might have gone up is not because skewness, but because kurtosis also went up because we have a higher peak right here, now in the middle. Kurtosis is not as big of an issue for coming up with accurate predictions um, as skewness is. Uh, kurtosis might simply mean that our range of potential values we can predict from are more narrow or more wide, but it doesn't have the same effect as skewness does where with a skewed data like this one, it means that our predictions in the middle will be accurate, but on either ends, they'll be more inaccurate. They'll be either too low or too high, or sorry, vice versa, too high here, too low over here. So, but this is what we do. We go through and make these mathematical transformations. And this is just like we did in Excel, so I'm not gonna go into a whole lot more depth here on this one. So we've addressed this, uh, learned how to address this issue of normality. And uh, next, let's talk about multicollinearity. Uh, multicollinearity, as you might remember, is the issue where we have uh, independent variables that are too highly correlated with each other. So for this one, I'm going to actually bring in and copy, rather than talk through the whole thing, I've created a function for you already in the book. I'm going to copy it in here. And let's talk through what this function is going to do, because it's pretty useful. This is my VIF function. So you might remember that VIF is equal to right here, VIF variance inflation factor equals one divided by one minus R squared 
of a model that predicts an, a particular feature from all other features in the model. So uh, this right here, we start out and um, I've got a for loop that says let's go through and, and let's calculate a linear regression for every feature. Um, but we got to drop the constant out of here just in case it's in there uh, in this DF. And we're going to set the Y equal to the column that we're currently looking at. And the X will equal all other columns. Now, next, we're going to go ahead and calculate an R squared by calling the linear regression. But we're going to do this from scikit-learn. We haven't done this yet in the class, but this is just another package that will do the same uh, exact MLR formula calls dot fit and one of the properties or the methods of this linear regression object is this score which returns an R squared score so it'll store that R squared back in here next if the R squared is less than one now that's what we expect all R squareds would be um, if the R squared is less than one then we're going to set the VIF score just like we did right here 1 divided by 1 minus r squared. If r squared is equal to 1, uh, then we had a problem, and there, that will give us a, zero, a divide by 0 runtime error. So if that happens, I'm just going to set VIF equal to uh, 1 here. And actually, you know what? I think a better thing to do would be to set it to like 100. I'm going to change that one. Because that means if r squared is 1, that means that it's perfectly represented by all other variables. Uh, that are already in the model. And then here I have just simply a dictionary that will give us each column name and its VIF score. Tolerance is another measure of multicollinearity, and it's just basically an inverse score of 1 minus R squared. Um, and it's the reverse, basically, of, of VIF, because VIF is 1 divided by that, whereas this one's just 1 minus R squared. So Tolerance and VIF together in the same dictionary. We're going to output the results, um, uh, create an output data frame, and then we're going to return it and sort in descending order by VIF score. All right, down here, let's just go ahead and call VIF and pass in our last set of X features. Is it right here? Yep, right there. Call this. Here we go. Region Southeast has a VIF of 1.6. That's got our most collinearity with the others, down to Children, which has almost zero collinearity. All of them are really pretty good. Um, as a reminder, our rules are uh, less than 10. Um, this is adequate. Less than 5. This is good. And less than 3. This is ideal but we can keep any of those. So what would I do? Well, if any of these were over 10, then I would simply have to remove them from my model and redo my regression results without that column in there. So that's how we meet uh, the assumption of multicollinearity. Uh, some of the other uh, assumptions, there are several others, but I'm not gonna worry about those for this video. Um, these are the two that have the biggest effect, in my opinion, on hurting our predictions and reducing their accuracy. So we'll stop here for now.